Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Voices for Change 2.0, the only podcast that focuses on mental health while mixing in movies, music, books, sports, and pop culture. Here are your hosts, Rebecca and Joe Lombardo. Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Voices for Change 2.0. Yeah, thanks for joining us on this wonderful Saturday morning, the first Saturday of April, the year of our Lord, 2019. <laughs> um, really quick, I'm, I'm going to start the show by saying this. Uh, I'm dealing with some cobwebs or something in my lungs, so I'm going to try really hard not to cough all during the show. Uh, if I do, please forgive me. Um, it's been It's been a struggle. So I don't know what's going on, and I really don't want to go to the doctor for it because I'm stubborn. I'm going to take you out back and shoot you. Oh, you, you would be doing me a service. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. You would do, be doing me a service, young lady. Yes, sir. So, so anyway, uh, what I wanted to talk about today was what we got to do last weekend was go see Captain Marvel. Yay! It was <laughs> great. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a blast, full of full of '90s goodness. Yeah, I was really, really surprised. It it, it wasn't at all like I thought it was going to be. Um, you know, I'm a fan of Brie Larson as an actress, but I wasn't convinced that she was the right choice to be a superhero. I guess would be the way to to explain it. And uh, and she did a really good job. Mm-hmm. And the soundtrack of the movie is great, and like our producer Scott said, we ended up loving the cat. Yeah, the cat was awesome. Um, the cat's one of the best parts of the whole movie. And uh, <clears throat> just a little side note thing, there is a scene that features prominently a uh, blockbuster video. And uh, I don't want to give away too much, you know, so spoiler alert and stuff, but uh, that blockbuster – they actually shot on location in Bend, Oregon at the very last blockbuster video in existence, which I think is cool. Yeah, it was it was kind of cool for me because I, I don't know how many of you know this, but I used to be a manager of blockbuster video. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I was there for quite some time and I ended up getting just about to the point where I was going to get my own store when I ended up leaving. So, um yeah, it, it it was pretty cool, it, and it was very authentic because they didn't have DVDs on the shelves. No, nope. they had actual VHS tapes on the shelves. So yeah, they really worked worked hard at um, making it have a '90s feel, and uh, which I can appreciate because that to me was the last great decade was the <laughs> '90s. Yeah, I think it, I think it says something when you know it's the decade before you married me. Yes, so. sir. Well, try not to read too much into that. <laughs> okay. So, but yeah, it was really good. Uh, it was a great movie. If you're on the fence on about seeing it, um, get off that fence and go see it. Especially if you're planning on seeing Avengers Endgame, um, you want a little background on Captain Marvel and who she is, and you know what her motivations are and everything. Um, it was it was informative for me because you know I'm I'm a big comic guy but I never read Captain Marvel I never got into her story the way I never got into Black Panther or a couple of the other you know Guardians of the Galaxy and whatnot so having these movies to kind of set up some kind of background for me and how they'll interact with the characters I I am familiar with um, that helped that helped a lot so yay that's awesome. <laughs> Well, today we have a really interesting show for you. My husband doesn't uh, cough up a hairball first. I'm trying not <laughs> to cough up a hairball. I know, honey. It's okay. I lose my voice every episode anyway. I, so I uh, You're cute. Sorry, I just had to say that. I'm looking at you. You're cute. Okay. Thanks, babe. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Um, We have a a really great guest with us today. She is uh, just an all-around amazing person. I'm astounded, but I knew she was really, 
really powerful as far as being a, um, a mental health advocate and, you know, sort of uh, life coach type, you know, uh, abilities that I noticed online from, from seeing her tweets and, and seeing her Twitter page and, and what have you. But I didn't, until I did a little research on her, I didn't realize how prolific she was. And uh, we're just really excited to have her here today. She has uh, a YouTube channel. She is uh, an intuitive healer. She uh, has, a, has a book called uh, You One Anxiety Zero, which um, I might have to check out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she also created a coloring book, which is another thing I might have to check out because I don't know if those of you that know me know that I'm really into coloring and, and whatnot. So, mm-hmm. um, so we're just really excited to talk with her today. And so welcome to the show, Jody Amon. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me here. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Thanks for being with us this morning. We're going to have so much fun. And, <laughs> <laughs> you're you're kind of like the Captain Marvel of the mental health community. Absolutely. All right. That's good. Yeah. That's <laughs> I'll be it. <laughs> I was like, going to be a that. superhero. Oh. Yeah. My kids are totally and, into Marvel and DC, so like I, I we haven't seen that yet, but um, yeah, it's we're really excited. good. We, we're excited. That's good. That's yeah. good. I'm, I'm excited yeah. for yeah. Endgame to come out and kind of close up that open hole from the last movie. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. And if you're if you're one of those people like me that that worries the cat lives, <laughs> so that's that's important. You know, if, if I find out there's a dog in a movie, there's a website actually for those of you who just taking a sidestep for a minute. For those of you that that worry like I do, if if you see that there's a dog in a movie or a pet in a movie, the the first thing that rushes my mind is, oh God, I hope they're going to make it through the movie. Mm-hmm. There's a website called uh, Does the Dog Die? dot com. Yeah, I just heard of that actually, too. Yeah. yeah, you can actually look up the movie and it'll say, you know, whether or not the dog makes it or if there's any scenes where it's abused or anything like that. And uh, they need to make one for cats, too, as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, anyway, that's a great site that, that that does make it. I'm sorry about the spoiler, but. Yeah, um, uh, and that, that's why we've never seen John Wick. So just yeah. putting that out there. That's why we never will. So Yeah, yeah, and I know it's a good movie and all, but yeah. So there's that. Yeah, definitely. So um Jody, where are you uh you said you were in Rochester, New York, right? Yes. Yep. We were just Born and raised. we were just in New York. Yeah. We love I love New York. Um we we went there. Uh, you know, I was going to say it was last year, but it's actually it was 2016 now. 2017. Yeah, we uh, we drove out September 2017 to uh, see our our good friend Dr. Robbie Ludwig and be on her show, and uh, didn't get to stay nearly as long as we wanted, but um, I still I loved it. You know. Yeah, That's it's a great state. Yeah. It's very diverse. <clears throat> you know, you have big cities. You have very rural and farmland. You have the ocean and you have lakes, small lakes, big lakes. So we have mountains and plains. It's, it's a really diverse state. Yeah. Well, speaking of anxiety, I have to tell you, right, right in the heart of New York City there, that was mass anxiety for me. I was just, I wasn't having a lot of fun. <laughs> I'll have to come back when I've got a, a a better frame of mind and and you know more willing to explore. Uh, you know, the very first thing that happened was somebody came up to me and asked me for money, mm-hmm. and it was just so stereotypical. And you know, I, I I was already sort of terrified of of the prospect of being on this on the streets of New York because there's just so many people, and I just don't get get around a lot of people very often, so. Yeah, maybe but we should do we, therapy right here on the, on the show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Oh, for sure. So if you don't have any questions for us, we're going to go ahead and jump in with the questions that we have for you. Excellent. Okay. So where does your mental health journey actually begin? Well, it began with my own experience. So when I was five, I was introduced to anxiety when I learned uh, that people die. And I, Mm. for the next 20 years, from age five to mid-20s, I really went in and out of um, episodes of really intense anxiety. You know, when I had lots of panic attacks and couldn't eat and couldn't go out and those kind of things. Um, And no no one in my family died, luckily. I I was very lucky, but it was... um, President's Day weekend, and we were it was at a, we were at a father's daughter event at the YMCA, and we were learning about the president Lincoln in Washington. And um, on the way home, it dawned on me like, where are they now? You know, so I asked my father, I was like, Daddy, where are the presidents now? And he said he got really pale, and his neck got really long, and um, definitely read the uncomfortable energy in his body. And he said they're dead, and I was like, what's dead? You know. And um, he said, they're not here anymore. They're gone. And, and it like the non the, the duality of the world, like anything that we have and is precious to us could be taken away, like hit me right to my soul. And I um, was terrified of any losing, yeah. you know, somebody and like felt like there was no security if at any time that security could be taken. Um, so I, you know, really struggled. But in my mid-20s, I was a social worker, so I'm a social worker. I'm a psychotherapist and i um, been doing it for 20 years. So I was in my young 20s as a psychotherapist, and I was experiencing a really big episode of anxiety, really intense panic. And um, and we were at roundtable, like, talking about our clients and talking about our worst cases. And people were talking about their clients with anxiety. And, I'm, you know, it happened for a few weeks in a row that I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm worse. I'm worse than their worst clients and it began this panic inside that day and I had I was like I had to get out of here for the last 20 years like I just was running away from anxiety it was this big kind of monster over my shoulder that had so much power and I was just trying to escape so I you know needed to get out of that room as a lot of people with anxiety could really relate to and I went Mm -hmm. I snuck out of the room I went into my car and I was pulling out of the spot I was like I got to get out of here And I looked at myself in the mirror and my face was really pale and my neck was really long. And I was like, Mm. okay, if I could, if I learned this, I could unlearn it. And so I I made Mm. a commitment right then in the car that I was going to figure it out. I had a young baby and um, a husband and I didn't want to uh, ruin their lives with this. You know, I couldn't barely do stuff. So I um, I made that commitment there and then that day to to, um, to to learn what how to get out of it and it took me a few more years but I did I figured out and and I kind of discovered these six steps to getting over your anxiety and that's what became my book I used it with thousands of my psychotherapy clients um, over the next twenty years and they work they work really well anxiety is highly treatable but we just don't know and a lot of people wait a very long time before they get any help. And so I wrote this book for people who might at least get a book <laughs> and help themselves feel better. And, and people are loving it. It's really helping a lot of people. So I'd love you to have it, Rebecca. I wish I knew what it was oh, yeah. to you before. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's incredible I, because so I, many people have anxiety, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're talking to two of them. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. I, well, I've said, I'm glad I'm here the, today. Yeah. yeah. I've got social anxiety and agoraphobia. So um, they're both so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just really, really enjoy the heck out of them. So, but it, what I, what I really took away from, from what you're saying is something that, that I've noticed in my own life. And that's the first time that you, that you realize that people can die or the first time you have a major death in your life, you never look at it the same way again in my opinion um you know i had aunts and uncles that passed away when i was when i was younger um and although they didn't have the same impact on me 
I, I kind of, I guess I sort of blew it off in a way. And I, I just was like, okay, you know, everybody in my, my immediate circle is fine. So, you know, I'm going to be okay. But when I lost my mom in 2008, um, that changed everything for me. Like death Mm -hmm. instantly became something that I feared. Um, I was worried constantly about everybody around me. You know, I worried about my dad who, you know, just passed away himself. And it's, there's so much anxiety, you know, with, with death as, as well and, and grief, you know, yeah. so um, I, I'm glad to be able to talk to you about that today as well. Uh, it's just such a struggle. It's just so hard to overcome. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And it is and, you know, people do overcome it and it is overcomable, but yes, it's a, you know, grief is, is a big instigator of anxiety and, it's such a painful time. Indeed, and uh, you know the um, the the thing that kind of struck me with what you were talking about about relate you know realizing when you were five is I actually had sort of a similar thing happen around that age. I was five or six, and I I can still picture it vividly in my mind. We uh, my folks and I used to live in an apartment, and my aunt and uncle were over visiting. And it was just a basic day like any other day. It was nice out and everything. I remember it being sunny and stuff. But um, <clears throat> for some reason, I had this uh, – like I got self-aware. I had this self-realization or something and freaked out because I'm like – I ran over to my mom. And I'm like, Mom, I don't want you to die. I just – I figured out that people die. And I don't mm-hmm. remember why or what caused it, but – you know, in that moment, you know, I just, I'm like, realized some, you know, one day my mom's going to die and I flipped, you know, and yeah, she's like, oh, I'm not going anywhere. And, you know, she's trying to console me and everything. And, but that was, uh, that was, that was bizarre. So, and that yeah, always stuck I with think me. that it does happen. It's like, if you, if anybody, you know what I realized, because I was so terrified of death, but when um, I realized when I was healing and recovering, I realized that because I was like, you need to go to a restaurant. And you're like, why are all these people freaking out? We are all going to die. Like, I, I couldn't, yeah. you know, and, and I realized mm. that everyone, if they thought about it, would be freaking out. Like, their adrenaline would yeah. release and they'd be freaking out. But we just don't think about it all the time. So the difference between me and those people was I was thinking about it all the time. <laughs> and they yeah. were, you know, kept themselves distracted or just, there's no... This is like really for you and thinking about it all the time. So, um, yeah, that's the difference is people with anxiety think about their fears all the time. And and there's a reason yeah. why that happens. But um, and then there's the people it's, and there's not much there's not much degree of difference in that. And I think a lot of people with anxiety feel like it's to, it's so different and that feeling of difference. Um, makes them so down on themselves that I think it increases their anxiety actually. Because we don't, when we're down on ourselves, we don't trust ourselves. And when you don't trust yourself, like you don't trust yourself to handle it if anything bad happens. And that's why we have anxiety. It's really a lack of trust mm-hmm. in ourselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's a very interesting way to look at it. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, the more you talk, the more I am interested in picking up your book. <laughs> Yay! What's interesting? What do you find interesting about the fact that it's the trust thing? Do I find interesting about it? Yeah. Um, I I don't know. I guess I I guess I've kind of never really had trust in myself really whole you know completely um and i never really thought about it you know really just sat down and and had it occur to me that that i didn't trust myself and i i've always had really poor self esteem um which i think could fall fall under the same category exactly. um you know um 
I what's just, it like to realize your anxiety is really from that lack of trust in yourself? It's a lot to think about. It's um, something I definitely want to, you know, look into more and, and really start to consider. But, you know, just for, for right now, it's, it's, it's a little bit overwhelming, to be honest. It's causing a little bit of anxiety. <laughs> okay, yeah, I know. I don't want to cause anyone anxiety. So let me tell you that because I just recently did a TEDx Wilmington talk. So if anybody wants to see it, they could just um, uh, Google Jody Ian and TEDx. But it's about um, why we have anxiety, why anxiety is so rampant in our culture. And so this might be a little bit more helpful because it will take it out of you and kind of put it in a cultural perspective. I think that might really help everybody listening. Oh, definitely. Yep. Okay. So, so, so what this is – go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to tell you about that. You, you can ask the question first. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I was actually going to ask you what what made you decide to become uh, an anxiety counselor and psychotherapist? And um, yeah, well, I work with all kinds of problems, but the thing is that anxiety comes with other problems, and it's something that people um, have kind of behind, lurking behind other problems. Either fear of the fear of unworthiness is behind all of our problems. But um, I really, when I was a, in high school, I wanted to be an architect, actually. And I did some volunteering hmm. then. And I, in the volunteering, I felt so uplifted. Like, of course, you remember when I was young, I was anxious a lot. And I had a lot right. of anxiety. And when you have anxiety and your life stinks, when you have anxiety so much, like it's, you know, you just feel so different, alone and isolated, that often you're depressed as well, um, mm-hmm. even down on yourself. And so I was like, I was just not in a good place, obviously, when I was young because I was all this stuff. And so I was volunteering, and it was the one place that I felt good. Like I could do something for other people. There was a little bit of sense of work. And in those connections I made with people when I was volunteering, I felt I felt um, good. I saw the good that they reflected back to me. And I realized, like, you know what, I helping people because I was so isolated being there for other people and helping other people was what like I understood it right so I understood the paradigm of pain I understood what it felt mm-hmm. like to be alone and and so I knew what to do to help people and so when I was that young when I was a junior in high school I switched and went into social work um, and never looked back like loved it every day of, of my life since and, it's been uh yeah almost 30 years since then so yeah and that's you know that's the one thing they say is if you find something that you really love doing you don't work a day in your life you know mm-hmm. and, and that's exactly. a, that's a blessing you know so that's really cool that you figured out you know that especially at a at a young age you know I'm I'm going to be 45 this month and I don't know what I want to do when I grow up <laughs> so right you know <laughs> do the do the math there but you know that there is something to be said for volunteering and helping people too. It's such a, uh, it's a warm feeling, you know. It's exactly, really such yeah. a good feeling, and yeah, uh, I, so yeah, you know, I I, I just I, I get it. And we uh, used to at work we used to do uh, this volunteer work. Uh, you know, going and helping out like food banks and stuff. And, uh, you know, you get done and you're like, wow, it's really cool that we get, got to spend time and, and do that. You know, it's good, good feeling, you know. And, exactly. Um, you know, it gets you out of your head too, right, Joe? Like, you know, when, exactly. we're, when we're anxious or depressed or we're in our head a lot and it's a, not a really great place to be, there's a lot of negativity in there. Um, we just continually hurt ourselves or, you know, hurt herself by feeling bad, I mean, or, or literally. Um, and so when we do stuff for other people or we get into other people's stories, there's a bit of a distraction, but there's also this just getting out of your own head that is very powerful for people as well. Uh, sometimes when people are really hurting and they're help, they're kind of, they help other people, but they're like a victim of it and make them more depleted. But this kind of helping is different that you and I are talking about. It's like, volunteering formally somewhere and you really see wow 
we can't sweat the small stuff. Look what people are really going through. And it, it does help us. It heals mm-hmm. us in a lot of ways. <clears throat> Definitely. I would, I would agree with you a hundred percent there. I mean, I, uh, I used to volunteer for um, the Michigan AIDS Coalition, and um, and I also went through the the training for uh, Crisis Text Line as well. Um, unfortunately, both of those situations ended with me feeling a little bit like maybe they weren't that healthy for me just because of where I was at emotionally at mm-hmm. the time. <clears throat> Pardon me, I lose my voice again as usual. <laughs> but um, yeah, I ended up not being able to follow through with with that. But the fact that I I went out there and I I tried something that that I never ordinarily would have was always a, a point of pride for me, despite not making it all the way to the end. Yeah, that's it's great. I mean, some things <clears throat> don't work out, and they're not really meant for us. But there, there might be something else that would be, um, you know, would be more uh, fit you. Like you love animals, you right. you love cats. And there's a lot of these equine centers, like, opening up where people go and either, um, you know, people who have uh, whatever, uh, like a developmental disability ride horses and you just help guide them around the circle. I mean, there's nothing, mm-hmm. it's all positive, right? You know, it's just it's like a beautiful, positive <laughs> atmosphere but you are doing something for somebody else and so there's there's definitely ways you can volunteer whether you're not triggered by someone else's um sadness but you could contribute to their you know happiness and good time right right exactly so um we actually need to take a, a quick break uh, we uh, usually take it about 15 minutes in, so um, we're running a little behind today, but it's all good. It's all, it's all good. It's, it's all good. good. Yeah. It's all good. <laughs> so, uh, Jody, we'll catch you on the on the other side of this break, and we'll be listening to uh, Circles by Brian Justin Crum.
Voices for Change 2.0. We're so glad to have you with us today. Indeed we are. Thanks for uh, thanks for tuning in. And if you're just tuning in, we are talking to the, to the wait for it, <laughs> lovely and talented Jody Amen. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. It's so sweet. <laughs> she gives me guff all the time when I describe our guests that way. Well, no, it's not so much... <laughs> It's, it's not so much the, the female guest, because it, it it makes sense for that, but when, it's when you describe our male guests as lovely and talented is when I, I kind of cringe. What, a male can't be lovely and talented? Absolutely. It just weird. <laughs> I'm lovely and talented. Emphasis on lovely. Okay. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> you should see the look we on her face right now, Jody. You're an equal opportunity complimenter. That's yeah. right. So, so Joe, <laughs> we're going to move ahead with our, our uh, questions here. Would you like to talk to us about your forgiveness masterclass? I'm sure. Yeah. I, you know, I just noticed that people, th- these negative self judgments that we all have, you know, it, they're so rampant and they're so powerful in people's lives. And so I created this um, class because people really don't know how to forgive. And we're talking about forgiveness. We're talking about like forgiving yourself, forgiving somebody else, because we think it means it's like condoning that it was okay that it happened. And so it really mm-hmm. pause, makes people pause and they're like, this is, it's not forgivable. Well, I like to think about forgiveness in a different way. And it's really about having some self-compassion. You know, when you forgive, you're forgiving for you, not the other person, because like that quote says, and there's a lot of different people that are associated with this quote, so I don't know who originated it, but um, drink, it's like resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for the other one to die. And that's what we're exactly. doing all the time. It's like we're drinking that poison. We're suffering so badly because we think they don't deserve our forgiveness. And and so I, I like to challenge that because I see how painful it is for people. Mostly they're holding, they're blaming themselves for stuff and holding a lot of that, like it's their fault that all these things have happened in their life. It's their responsibility. And it's really keeping people stuck uh, and anxious and depressed and, you know, and all those other things. It's really this stuckness and it's a huge block in people's lives. So um, they don't know how to do anything about it. You know, we didn't. We don't learn self compassion in school. That's too unfortunate. Every every middle school, they taught a class on how to have compassion for yourself because people really don't know how. Um, doing these negative self judgments. So I put together this class. It's online, so anyone can take it. Um, it's just jodyamon.com slash forgive to get there. And it, it's, people say it's so powerful because. They're like, I want to forgive, I just don't know how. Or they set the intention to forgive, and then the feelings come back, and they say, well, I didn't really do it right. I guess I don't know how to do it, and they feel worse about themselves. So I want to, like, stop all that, you know, and, and, and really help people do the work that they need to do and practice it. It's easy. It's not hard, actually, um, but they just have to know what to do. That's right up my alley because yeah. I'm – and I know Beck's like this too. I'm I'm great at beating myself up over stuff, and you know, being able to forgive myself for things and just let go and move on and and get out of my own head. I mean that that's a huge skill to learn. Um, I'm gonna check that out because uh, I I know for a fact I need it. I I, I know I need it. Yeah, we both do. Honey. You know. Um, it's it's a constant thing, you know. Be you it. actually had mentioned uh, about school, and, and one of our questions for you was, you know, do you think society as a whole would would benefit from teaching mental health courses in schools? 
Yes, except for, unfortunately, like everyone thinks about it differently. And so now there, it's becoming a little bit more um, mainstream and we realize, well, we have a crisis on our hands. So many young people are anxious. It's one of our biggest problems. That was my, what my TEDx talk was about, was how to calm anxious kids. But, um, yes, but there, if you get a speaker who has, like, a more traditional idea of mental health, I don't find that very helpful. If you have me come speak to your school, I really can make big changes and, and have people help people get better faster just because I've been doing this so long. But um, mm-hmm. so I do the circuit, like high schools and colleges, and, and, and do my training, but I think it's very powerful. And I could teach the teachers and the counselors there how to help in faster ways because they don't really feel equipped. They don't really know what to do or how to do it because a lot of them are, like, feeling the same way or, you know, having mm-hmm. their own experiences. They All the kids are anxious. They don't know what to do. They're trying to teach them how to breathe. Um, you know, and I love mindfulness. I use it every day. It really helps me a lot in my life, and I, and I honor it. But there's sometimes people are so scared, and you have to do something first, right? You have to deconstruct the anxiety. You have to take the power of the anxiety down before you could do, before the mindfulness could really do its work. Uh, and, and that's yeah. what makes the difference. You know, and, and these poor kids these days, I mean, they've got anxieties that we never saw when we were that age, you know, having to worry about going to school and being shot for crying out loud. I mean, I right. I can't imagine that, you know. I mean, that's just one example, you know. And there's right. so many different things these poor kids have to deal with, you know. It, uh, it, it's interesting because you yeah. say that, but our world has never been safer. It was really much more dangerous when we were young. We just didn't have the, we didn't have that kind of thing, you know, a school shooting, mm-hmm. and we didn't have, but there was other things that were more, like in general, we were more at risk of, of being yeah. in violence, but we don't see it that way. We see that that risk is higher now. Um, again, I mentioned this in my TEDx talk too. So we feel like the world's, world's getting scarier, even though statistically the world is getting safer. It's never been this safe ever in human history. But with that virtual trauma of seeing the news all the time, and then these risks are seen different and random, and, and it seems closer to us than it was. Um, so and kids are coming away with the idea that it is more dangerous now, and it is not more dangerous now, actually. Mm. Hmm. Maybe it's just it seems that way because it's so prevalent in the news and yeah, it, it you know, absolutely it, it, why it seems that way. Our world is smaller. Mm-hmm. Like we see all this violence on the news. We hear about every little tiny thing that we would never hear about before. If something happened in a yeah. different city, like we we just didn't have the news cycle twenty four seven. And and the online the news that like they have to fill a lot of content, and so every little you know, small town issue we read about. So it seems like it's more and more, but those things always happen. And actually they're happening less frequently, but it seems like much more frequently. Because we witness it and we feel it, we're empathetic. We're social beings. We're so empathetic that we feel it, but there's nothing we can do about it. You know, so we're kind of feel more helpless, which increases our anxiety. And and it's just a, a really difficult thing. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. That makes a yeah. lot of sense, you know. And you know, you, you also trauma provides for for headlines, you know. And and they're at this point they're more about ratings than informing us, you know. Exactly. So, if it bleeds, it leads, and so they, you know, mm-hmm. it is a tactic to get more viewers, and it works. I know I'm yeah. a helper. I mean, I'm a I, I I click on all those headlines every time. It's like the two year old, blah blah blah, on those. Apple News. So Apple News learns that I want to know about all these child deaths, which is, you know, I'm like, oh, because I feel like I can't not click on it because I care about these families and I'm worried about them and think about right. them and I love to send, like, prayers and energy to them. And so I'm clicking on all that. And it's, you know, the way we Google nowadays, like, Google learns what I like. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. And, and yep, Apple exactly. News, like, learns what you like, so it gives me all those stories and these, you know, these uh, terrible stories. But it's happening. Yep. It always was happening. At least I know that. Um, 
I have clients <laughs> who come to me and they feel like, oh my God, it's more. It's not more. It's less. Um, yeah, it's it's why I'm just I'm picturing, you know, Apple News and Google being like, oh, she enjoys death and destruction. Let's give her more. I, it, <laughs> you know, it is, and it's laughing because I know it, and I keep putting that. Yeah. Because I'm like, oh, as a yeah. two year old was I whatever, and um, you know, I don't know. I love children. I just love children. I have three of my own, and I love. I worked with children for 30 years, and and I just have a special place. I really want them to. I really want to give them the tools that they need to create a better future. And I'm worried because of what's happening. Um, like people are feeling powerless. Yes, we're, we're literally in a safer world, but people are feeling more vulnerable and unsafe and powerless. And that's what I expressed in my TEDx talk. I explain why. And in my You Want Anxiety Zero book, I do also. And I have 200 videos on YouTube. So it really helps people take the mystery out of anxiety when they understand what's yeah. going on. Um, but the, you know, it's just um, kids are feeling so powerless, and so that's where my message, my next book is going to be for teenagers, and I'm so excited about it. I, I want it out tomorrow, you know. I, we need it now, <laughs> um, but it's um, it's being published by a company, and you know that always takes a little bit longer. So yeah. I'm, I'm really wanting to do this work and committed to, you know, talking to as many schools as I can directly to the kids, but to the counselors, to the teachers, and colleges also, the people who are the front line with these children and giving them those tools that they need to help kids grow to, to feel more powerful, empowered in their life, that they're an agent, that they could do something, and then we'll see the anxiety go way down. Definitely. Yeah. 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 And your your book, uh, just to touch on that a little bit more, it, you said it's, it's it's called "You Won Anxiety Zero: Win Your Life Back from Fear and Panic." Let's talk a little bit about that. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Um, my well, the book is you know, I, my message is that anxiety is curable, and that's why if you want anxiety zero, like anxiety, we're total. I totalize anxiety. So you know, there's a lot of Everyone thinks about anxiety in different ways, but my definition of anxiety is the leftover fear response when you're not in physical danger. And and I think mm. it's very helpful to people to know that there's nothing good about anxiety because people are like, some anxiety is good, like you wear a helmet. I think that's common sense. And if we think some anxiety is good and some anxiety is bad, it's going to be confusing because we think that we think, oh, it's rational to be afraid of death, so I'll keep that one. But it interrupts your life. It makes you suffer. It makes you not really live, you know, when you're thinking about it all the time. So I don't believe in there's any rational fear. Sometimes there's a fear, a stimulus, that we actually need to have that adrenaline to survive, to, you know, run away or fight something. There is sometimes we need it. Of course, that triggers. Uh, 98% of the time we don't need that fear response, but when we need it, we need it. We don't want to get rid of it, you know? So yeah. mm-hmm. so I like to call that, you know, be very defined, like that's the fear response. That's the triggers when we don't need it sometimes, but it is good. But the wearing the helmet and the seatbelt and being like, I'm not safe here, I'm not going to do this, that's that's common sense. That's, that's um, intuition even. Um, that's knowing your surroundings. And so those are skills. I don't call that, oh, it's good anxiety. That's too confusing for people. But so that's what, yeah. so anxiety, that leftover fear response when you're not in physical danger, when you don't need it, it's only suffering. And we can definitely get rid of that. That doesn't mean you'll never have adrenaline again. It just means you'll never have that suffering feeling of helplessness and um, panic and anxiety, that, you know, that dread and something's going to be wrong and that desperation to get out of that feeling. You don't have to have that anymore. You could live a life without that. That that would be nice. Yeah, that would really be um, just eye opening and change change my life for sure as well as yours. So. Yeah, I, absolutely. I'd love to ask Rebecca yeah. or Joe, either of you, like, what do you have you thought in the past that this is just how you are and you have to just deal with it? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, just, you know, constantly having, uh, you know, learning how to live with being in fear of different things, you know, it, it's almost, it almost comes to a point where it's as natural as breathing, 
you know. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, you know, you when you're, I, I suffer from bipolar disorder amongst other conditions. And there comes a time when, you know, not, it doesn't happen for everybody, I realize, but it happened for me where I, it, it occurred to me, well, I'm going to be on medication, you know, for the rest of my life. This is what I need to continue functioning. I've been off of it and I did horribly. So I know that it, it's something that I, that I need to continue to do. And, and I think that all my symptoms with whichever, you know, um, type of mental health issue that I have, I think my symptoms to me have always sort of been, it's always going to be there kind of thing. Right. Um, I, right. I just have to teach myself how to maneuver around them, basically. Mm-hmm. Right. In, in bipolar, it's different than anxiety, but anxiety comes with other yeah. problems. So anxiety comes, you know, the bipolar, there's a connection definitely that, um, mm-hmm. yeah. that make that, that triggers your anxiety when, when the vibe, when you're being affected by. Yeah. Just, over just anything or that, under enthusiasm, right? Right. You know, anything that I, I struggle with, I have, uh, pretty much come to terms with the fact that the, that it's always going to be there. And I've never really looked at any of, of my various health concerns as treatable, to be honest with you. I've, I've always kind of just said, you know, okay, well, I got to, you know, go with the flow and do the best that I can and, and hope to, hope to live a happy life, basically. Yeah. Well, that well, that is. Um, I, I think with bipolar, that's a fantastic attitude to have, and just to keep going. Like you're doing this radio show, you're, you know, engaged in your family life, and there's you are living. Um, sounds like it. Anxiety. Some people have anxiety when they have other um, mental health issues, and some people have it when they don't. And some people have a history of trauma, and some people the anxiety themselves. The anxiety itself is their history of trauma. Um, so there, it, it's complicated because there's a lot of things going on here in our culture. But in mm-hmm. general, you can – there is a possibility, not that it's going to eliminate all of the things that you deal with, Rebecca, but that you can have a different relationship with the anxiety part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it it'd be nice not needing to have a prescription of Xanax at the ready, you know, if I'm having a particularly bad day. You know, right. I'm grateful that I have it, you know, cuz there and I don't take it every day, but I, I take it when I do need it and you know, there are days when you know, when I get overwhelmed by things, you know, and but, Right. In you know, a way like I mean, that just gives you confidence. You know for sure if if it is a day that you can't uh, that you are overwhelmed, you have that backup. And in a way, even when you don't take it, it's part of the therapy, right? Because you mm-hmm. know you have it if you needed it, and then you never are freaked out because anxiety needs you to be scared. Yeah. And, and so there's something very powerful in knowing, like, okay, if I get overwhelmed by a panic attack, I have this. And so you're less scared of it, and it comes less often, even when you don't take it. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So let's see. What do we have for questions here? Well, we we talked a little bit about your uh, TED Talk, TEDx Talk, mm-hmm. uh, and you were saying that it was about um, essentially raising healthier children. Do you yeah, want to talk a little bit more problem, about that? Sure, sure. I'll just kind of, uh, yeah, anyone could go li- listen to it, obviously, or watch it. But it's about um, why anxiety is so rampant. So why is it beyond the mental health issues that cause it, like bipolar and other things, or the um, or trauma, history of trauma that's bringing it in, why culturally anxiety is so rampant? is I I outlined three things. And m- most of it is like we're getting these messages. With the, with the advent of phone and TV, 
TV first and now screens everywhere. Um, mm-hmm. We have we're just bombarded with 4,000. This research says 4,000 messages a day. Kids are getting kids under 18 are getting 4,000 messages a day, and I feel like these messages, um, you know, it's, uh, give three very dangerous ideas to kids. One is, um, you know, other people are better than me. One is the virtual trauma that we talked about. And the other is this commercialism, like you should just, you get stuff just because you're you. And kids aren't learning cause and effect, like that they have to do something to make something happen. We're losing it. Mm-hmm. The whole generation is losing this idea that they do stuff to change their life. So they're losing their sense of agency. They're losing their empowerment. And they're all walking around feeling um, powerless worthless and and out of control and it just expands then they're isolating themselves and that you know the negativity is getting worse in those states and so um then they feel down on themselves and they don't trust themselves and they're frozen in that fear instead of doing something and so you know companies can hire a young person they're like they don't do anything (laughs) like there's no work ethic there's no like we're Mm -hmm. losing our cause and effect and and so I feel like what parents can do, I, in my TEDx talk, among a lot of other things to help our kids, one is like giving them chores. And, and I outline three kinds of chores that's good for the brain and the uh, emotions, the confidence, and the, you know, physically also. But one of the three is volunteering, is generous towards doing things for other people and, and volunteering. I, I definitely promote that. So I was glad you said that, Joe, in the beginning of our call. Yeah, so... Um, Jody, are you, are you still there? Oh, yep, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Sorry, I thought, I thought we... Yeah, I thought we lost you there. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't so, hear you for a moment was, either. Fun. I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was weird. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> that was, uh, Did, was I that in the middle of the talk? Was I in the middle of the sentence? Oh, okay. Yeah. What part? I, I have a feeling that uh, we were the only ones that uh, that lost you. I think the, the oh, okay. rest of the, the listening audience heard everything you were saying. It just... We uh, lost you on our end for a second. Yeah, no that that happens to us. Oh. It gives us anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great that you do this show. Like, you know, it, it sounds like the anxiety is not stopping you in your life for making a difference to other people. Yeah, you know, we the one thing that we've discovered over time is the more we step forward and talk about what's going on with us or what's going on with our guests, you know, if they're dealing with different mental health issues and and shedding light on those issues. um, That's how you overcome the fear and anxiety of things, you know, is, is by talking about it and confronting it, you know, and that can be scary, you know, and, and, you know, it was scary early on for, for us when we started talking about the things that Beck goes through and now it's commonplace for us. You know, there's, you know, we don't worry about, you know, judgment or, or anything like that, you know, because, you know, now it's a matter of, well, if you're going to judge me for, you know, having this mental health issue, that's not, that's not my issue. That's your issue. Right. You know, you're, right. you're the one. Yeah, with the I love it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's how we've, we've maintained uh, such a, a healthy relationship for almost 18, 18 years. 18 years of August. <laughs> yep. So, um, yeah, that's it, it is communicating with each other. And, and I make sure, no matter how hard it is, I make sure to let him know exactly where my head is at, even if I'm not entirely sure where my head is at. I, I'll tell him that, too, mm-hmm. because, um, you know, we – we have to lean on each other. We both um, have had people sort of walk out of our lives due to, you know, whatever difficulty we were going through at the time. And me especially, um, after my 
you know, my suicide attempt in 2013, I had a lot of people walk out of my life and uh, I had to learn how to trust people all over again, which I still am not entirely sure I've I'm mastered that, but I'm working on it. I think we so, all are. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. So, um, we're, so, uh, yeah, we're, um, we're getting low on time. Yeah, we're definitely getting low on time, but I did want to quickly ask you, um, what would you say to someone who has uh, recently uh, lost someone in their life? What would be some positive steps for them to getting past the pain of that? Well, I guess being really gentle and realizing that grief is different for, for everybody. Because when we feel grief, sometimes we think that we're not handling it or something like that. There's a, that discourse that hurts people in grief. But that, you know, whatever your grief is, whatever you're doing is exactly what is normal. That is very helpful. But also connecting with that person that you lost, feeling that connection, knowing that biological death happens, but the relationship always goes on, right? So the the way that person influenced you, what they appreciate about you, what they know about you. So you can almost ask any question in your head. You know how they're going to answer it because you're that close with them you know, that you know what they're mm-hmm. going to say. And <clears throat> when I talk to people who lost them and they all know, yeah, I know exactly what my mom would say. Um, it's it's really healing to kind of go back. And even after people pass, like relationships even change. Like they're still growing. Um, they're still developing. They're still like going past the other barriers that have been there in the past. And so when people go back to that connection, because I think in grief we feel like we have to disconnect. And, um, and we're so, um, you know, we're so, we're so um, attached to that feeling like we have to say goodbye. And I like to turn that upside down and say, this is not goodbye. This relationship could keep going and growing, and their influence on you could really go to a lot of different areas. And it doesn't make it okay because you still don't have that physical presence and that hugs and those kind of things. There's still there's still a lot. But that grief is a testimony to how much you loved that person. And it's a better way to stand um, to think about it that way. I'd have to really personally talk to someone because I'd be having them introduce me to the person who's passed and tell me all about them and and um, and then I help really make that connection. But I use my intuition too and mediumship um, to connect with people as well. That's a great response. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, and, and it's a Thank solid you. way for us to to close out the show. Um, yeah, tell us what what is uh, quickly what is next for you on the horizon. Um, like I said, this this book for young people is coming out, um, and I'm just doing a lot of trainings in schools and colleges, trying to help. Uh, help kids find their power uh, that and find their agency so that we could really decrease the, the intensity of the anxiety and depression that's out there and, and create kids who know how to do stuff and know how to make things happen. I think we're losing that in this generation. So that's really my goal in the next year is to get in, as many, in front of as many people as I can, probably the next five years or whatever until I have the next goal. But <laughs> but thanks so much for well, that's good. <laughs> Sure, and, and just to um, to go over it one more time, if you want to, Jody has a, a TEDx talk. She's got books. She's got all kinds of great stuff uh, going on. So if you Google Jody Amen, and that's A M A N, uh, yep. you will will find her. But you also have a website, do you not? I do. It's JodyAmen dot com, and I still work with people. Uh, privately, so I still am doing the work. I work. I do video counseling with people all over the world or coaching, and so um, I am available. If someone's like they heard this and like and this is someone who gets it. I absolutely get it, and I will help you. So, um, and I have tons of videos. If that's you know too expensive and you can't do that, I have cl- my cl- my master classes are pretty inexpensive, but also I have the free videos on YouTube. That's awesome. Okay, and what is your uh, Twitter handle one more time for the folks who it's are listening? Same, it's jo- Jody Amon, J-O-D-I-A-M-A-N. 
Well, she makes everything very easy for you. So yeah. uh, <laughs> if you're if you're looking for help yeah. with with anxiety or or you're experiencing grief or you know just a myriad of things that she can help you with. That's Any emotional where you want to go. I'll help you clear them. Yay! That's wonderful. Yay. So, That's awesome. You, <laughs> you're doing the work of the gods. Absolutely. Thank you. So, um, hang on the line, Jody. Uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna say goodbye to you off the air. But uh, everybody else, here is Coat of Armor by David Hernandez, and uh, we'll see you next week. We'll see y'all next week. Thanks for tuning in.
Join us next week as Rebecca and Joe continue to battle the stigma of mental illness. Follow us on Twitter at Voices for Change RJ and on Facebook at Voices for Change 2.0.